Our next question comes from Scott Random. It's just a random question. Whatever happened to the Z-Man, Tom Zink? His career ended in the mid-90s after being released by WCW with two short stints in All Japan and the AWF. In the early days of the internet, he was extremely outspoken against his time in the WWF and WCW, but then seemingly disappeared. The only thing I could find is this mug shot from 12 years ago, which he posted oh, in his Lord. email. First, can Jim share some positive and or negative memories of Tom Zink and WCW? Second, why was Zink's career over before he reached 40? Was he blackballed? Third, uh, does Jim have uh, any clue what Zink how many has been question, How many random questions does he have? Third, what was third? What was third? Third, does Jim have any clue what Zink has been up to? I don't recall seeing his name on any convention or other type of pro wrestling appearances since those shoot interviews from the early 2000s. No, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen or heard. I have not seen or heard from Tom Zink as far as I know since last time that I worked with him in WCW. Um, now, having said that, no, I, I don't think he's was blackballed and I, and he wasn't into, he was a, and we've talked about it when we've talked, told some Brian Pillman stories here lately, but real briefly, Tom Zink was a great looking guy who was on a $3,000 a week contract in 1990 for WCW because he was a good athlete and a great looking guy who you would think, and a lot of people did that didn't know much about wrestling like Jim Hurd. Uh, you would think would be a, a you know main event level guy because he was a good looking guy and had the size and everything, but he just didn't connect. And it was it, he he was a nice guy. His promos weren't the worst I've ever seen, but they were far from the best. His work was not the worst I've ever seen, but it was far from the best. His attitude was not the worst I've ever seen, but it was far from the best. Tom just didn't catch on, and nothing really distinguished him. I, the, the only thing that I ever know that, that <laughs> I guess I could say this now, it's been 27 years since I was on the booking committee. I got the, the first time they did a drug test in WCW. I remember they were talking about it and, and basically they knew going in at, at that time, I think the, the three people in the company that would able been able to pass a drug test were me, Ric Flair and Ole Anderson. So they knew that, you know, but it was, they were, I think, checking for more serious things or the steroid level. They just wanted to see where everybody was at. And the only results I really remember people talking about and laughing about were that Zinc failed the test for pot spectacularly with levels <laughs> never before having been seen by the doctors or something like that. Um, but no, there was, I didn't have any crosswords with him, but we weren't real close friends either. It, it was like he was just there and then he wasn't. I think that probably is then maybe he he probably didn't like the rest after working in wwf and wcw where else are you gonna go if and he was used to making big money because he'd all, always made it uh since i mean when he started out in in you know working for Vern in the dying days of the awa but he got a, a spot real quick because of the way he looked so you know, you get in the wrestling business, he's neither, neither really good nor really bad, but he makes big money. And then he's gone through the both companies that can pay him big money and nobody else, you know, can. And, and it, he wasn't in demand because he wasn't very good. So uh, I'm sure he's found some other things to do. The Adrian Zmed of professional wrestling. Tom <laughs> Zink. I must say, I was nine years old when he came into the NWA and 10 years old when he kind of got that push with him and Pillman as an undercard tag team feuding with the Express. And then, of course, he got the TV title. I think he beat Arn Anderson for the TV title. He was over with me. There, there's something that could have been done with him despite whatever he could do in the ring. Maybe a heel turn would have been good considering his natural personality. But, <laughs> um, you know, you look at his runs. He was in the WWF. They were about to put the rocket on the Can-Am connection. And whatever the falling out was between him and Martel and him in the office, he's gone. They replaced him with Tito Santana. And then he was in the AWA a little bit. He was in Portland a little bit. You actually, I brought something up to you a while back and you told me you had no memory of it. And I just looked it up. Tom Zink had a cup of coffee in 84 in Mid-South. Do you remember this? What? I do not. Well, let's I didn't it, know he was even working that early. I, oh my God. Then in that case, he should have been a lot better in Atlanta. He was on the, he was on the undercard of the last stampede in New Orleans. What? Tom Zink beat Jerry Gray. You know what? Now, 
Where did you see this? I'm looking results online. He worked April 2nd. Results online. Do you have the program for that event? I don't have the program, though. I do have the program for that event, and it is not within reach because, for one thing, it's, it's framed and on my wall. But I'm thinking that someone uh, wrote the wrong name down because there was a guy at that point in time in Mid-South, a big, bald guy with a mustache and a beard named Tom Lentz, L-E-N-T-Z. And that makes some sense, but Tom Zink does not make sense in that spot. And I'm going to bet you $10 that somebody's made a mistake right here, right now. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it. $10 wagered. We need to, we need to verify, and maybe the cult of Cornette can do this, or maybe I can just get off my fucking lazy ass and un- take that frame or off the program, but I think it's Tom Lentz. I will accept your $10 bet. I have found three results. And let me just frame this with what made me look for this. Years ago, Tom Zink was on Dave Meltzer's show, and he mentioned that he didn't get along with Bill Watts. And he said part of the reason was he worked for Bill Watts for less than a week in 1984, and his father died. And when he went to go back to Minnesota, Watts said, you're a flake, boy. And that was, <laughs> that was the comment. Well, I, found, I found three results. April 2nd, 84, Baton Rouge. Tom Zink defeated Jerry Gray. And on that show, Bobby and Dennis beat Porkchop Cash and Bill Dundee. And then on April 6th and 84 in Houston, Tom Zink defeated John King. And again, you guys wrestled Dundee and Porkchop on that show. And then, of course, the Superdome, the last stampede. The second match from opening. The opening match listed here is John King defeated Joe Savaldi. And then Tom Zink defeated Jerry Gray. Well, all right. Then in that case, I guess I've lost the $10 to you. I'll, I'll, I'll get that in the mail to you. But I, well, I don't even remember him. And, and, and that does sound like something that Bill Watts would have said. He said you should have planned the, you should have gone to the funeral before you left town or something like that. I just love that, though. I, uh, Mr. Watts, I have to leave. I'm so sorry. You're a flake, boy. <laughs> <laughs> what? You just got here. <laughs> well, but, but you know what? Okay, then that means he had been wrestling for six years. In 1990. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, take back what I said about, you know, (laughs) he shouldn't have been that good. He's the one that in, in, in literally in 1990, right after we had left the next clash, I believe it was Zink versus Brian Lee on the clash of champions. Oh yeah. He gives Brian a huge hip toss. And I'm the spot was going to be that he'd hip toss Brian and when Brian fed up to his feet, Zink would go to the corner, jump up, and do a turnaround crossbody. Well, when he hip tossed Brian, Brian's out there working hard. He's probably trying to get a job. He takes a at Brian six four and two seventy five or whatever takes a huge hip toss, lands all the way across the ring and bounces up into the turnbuckles, and doesn't have time to regain his feet because he's just been thrown all the way across the ring. And Zink turns around without looking jumps up on the far turnbuckles and does a turnaround cross body into the middle of the ring to dead air. It looked like a suicide attempt on national television <laughs> and landed on his face. And, and, Oh, for God's sake. Anyway. Yeah, that was, it, it was another case. We, we had two programs like that in WCW. The midnight express did. We worked with Brian Pillman and Z man, which meant we had a tag team program with Brian Pillman. And we had a tag team program with the Dynamic Dudes, which meant we had a tag team program with Shane Douglas. Back to back. If we could have just put Shane Douglas together with Brian Pillman, that may have worked. I guess it kind of makes sense that you wouldn't really remember Zink being there because this is Mid-South, this is Watts. If he's in the babyface dressing room, you may have never seen him. Well, that's another thing. What towns did you say? Baton Rouge. We we weren't together in Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge, Um, Houston, and the Superdome. Okay, yeah, no, we would have never seen a baby face in any of those three buildings because the dressing rooms were separate. But looking at the last Stampede card here, you know, I know the main event's obviously legendary, but when you look at the whole card, it's pretty stacked. Of course, John King over Savaldi, Tom Zink over Jerry Gray, the Rock and Roll Express versus Nikolai Volkov and the Russian Invader, whoever that is. Uh, I bet you that that was Jerry Novak, who was the Russian Invader in Memphis at the time, Jerry Novak of the Bounty Hunters. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Buddy Landell defeated Lanny Poffo. Kerry Von Erich from Dallas against Masao Ito. 
Terry Taylor versus Butch uh, beat Butch Reed via disqualification. I, did you wrestle Dundee and Porkchop before the main event against Watson Stagger Lee? Yes, because the main event was a lights out match. So we had to work twice that night, and it was supposed to be the Bruise Brothers, uh, Porkchop and Dream Machine. Because they were bringing Pork Chop and Dream down, they would have gotten over huge in Mid South Wrestling, and they did their first appearances. People loved them, and they hadn't even really been on TV yet. And that's when Dream broke his ankle. His his final, all those years he had loved the wrestling business, wanted to be in the business, and his first chance to actually make big money because the opening match guys in '84 were making thousand dollars a week in Mid South. His and he would they were going to be featured. And work with us, a tag team program, blah, blah, blah. His first chance to make big money, he broke his ankle. And that was the, pretty much the beginning of the end. So, but anyway, so yeah, we worked with Pork Chop and Bill Dundee, who was filling in because, you know, fuck, it was a last minute thing. And even though he was the booker, he wasn't wrestling there at that time. And then we went back and had the main events. <laughs> yeah. And in between that, you had Wrestling 2 defeating TA. And then Jim Duggan beat Crusher Darso in a coal miners Russian roulette match. So pretty stacked show. Yeah, well, it was the Superdome, baby. The Superdome, baby. 